Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this song of a young girl you called to bear your son into our world. We thank you that her song um, brings us uh, through her story to what you've done for all Israel and all the world through Abraham's seed forever. Uh, help us to rejoice in this song and in your, in your Christ child now and always. We pray. Amen. All right, it works. The prayer brought another. Here's Robert. <sighs> joining, joining, joining. There's Robert. <laughs> Good morning, Robert. <laughs> Off of chair. Those are either. Are those Advent candles or lightsabers you got there? <laughs> Good morning. You're still connecting to audio, I see, but hopefully you can hear us. There we go. Morning. 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 We just uh, opened in prayer, and we're gonna we're gonna hear one more Magnificat rendition. It's uh, it's Bach. It's three minutes, even though it, it's all it's actually fifty minutes total. So we're only going to get one word into Box Magnificat. It's going to take three minutes to get through his the one word, but this will be a yet another uh, uh, version of the song. So let's share a computer sound. Do that and this. <laughs> Okay, 
And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. Okay, we're going to finish this song today. We're going to we're going to do a little bit in verse fifty, and then carry on from there. Uh, hi, Gramer, welcome. So we've been in uh, Mary's Magnificat in Luke chapter one. So Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament, maybe a more than a little more than three quarters through. Uh, but uh, Luke chapter one, verse forty six, is Mary's song, and uh, this is our third and final week moving through the song today. We're going to look at six works of God, six things that God does now. Uh, the first week, of course, we saw that Mary magnifies God for regarding her with favor, for, for gracing her with his, with his uh, regard, um, not because she's the humblest in the world, but because she is lowly, um, and, and he's going to bless uh, this one. Uh, we looked last week uh, about, um, about the things that God has done for her and, and uh, began to turn the corner towards the world so that now through her child, God's mercy will be for uh, generation to generation. Uh, but today now we're gonna see six things that the Lord does uh, in, in these great reversals uh, of raising up and toppling and filling and emptying. And the first work is this, verse 50, God's mercy. Mercy is the first work. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God's mercy. And this, of course, we've, we've, uh, we've already seen. She's praised God for having mercy for her, for regarding her with grace and favor. And now God's mercy is likewise for people who fear, fear God. Uh, to, fear, fear, to have fear of the Lord, you know, that's, we've talked about this uh, from time to time together, but you know, to fear the Lord is to have reverence. It's to, to make a clear distinction between I'm God, I'm not God. <laughs> uh, God is God and I am not. And to fear God is, is both to know that, uh, um, that he is mighty and we are uh, at his mercy. Uh, but at the same time, to, to fear and revere God is to say, God has actually put, placed his name on us. He's called us his own. And so we can revere this one who could have just, uh, cast us away or never caused us to be in the first place. But instead, God wants to be known. God wants to be in relationship with his people. God wants to be known according to his mercy, not according to his fearfulness. And so uh, uh, for those who fear the Lord, he actually turns toward us his loving heart uh, so that we would not fear. So that like the angel said to Mary and to others, do not fear. Uh, so we fear God in order not to fear God in, 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 a, in a particular movement of the gospel. So this is God's first work is, is mercy. Part of, the, part of this means um, uh, to fear God is to say, God's calling the shots uh, that if God would bless uh, either me, Mary here, uh, or if God would bless any of us with his gifts, um, we are, we are willing to receive these with joy and gratitude, but we're also willing to go without such things. That for God's sake, for the sake of the one who we, who we uh, revere, if God uh, wishes to uh, uh, bring us through trial or to, um, to test us or to uh, remove goods or um, you know, uh, to, in fact, bring us into the consequences of our sins and our uh, misuse of his good gifts, uh, then, then uh, by faith, we have to be willing also to uh, have nothing but God's mercy, <laughs> to, to, to lose everything but, but God's mercy. Um, 
This comes out in, uh, in Luther's great Mighty Fortresses Our God here. You know, were they to take our spouse, goods, honor, child, or, or were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever. This is that kind of like, um, uh, uh, that mightiness of faith, which um, even it is, as it sees itself as poor and hungry and powerless, it has God and therefore has everything. And we'll see this as we go through the rest of the song is we'll see that um, the rich don't think they're going to be toppled and the poor don't ever think they're going to be rich. Uh, and so, you know, in all these ways, God is working in a hidden way, apart from what we usually judge. We usually judge with our eyes and see that, oh, God's blessed this person because they're rich or powerful or famous. And God has not blessed this person. God must, uh, um, you know, someone came to me this week. God must be mad at me because my loved one has got cancer. Uh, you know, what did I do to anger God? Which also means, what can I do to remove God's anger? Uh, this, is a, this is a fearful thing. But we have God's mercy. Mary has God's mercy. And sometimes that's all you have. And certainly for Mary, um, when she's going to have to tell her family and to Joseph that she's with child, and it's not a sin, it's actually of the Holy Spirit, you know, like they're going to believe that. Um, she has nothing but God's mercy at this point. Um, she does have Elizabeth. She can run to Elizabeth with haste, uh, which is what she's done here. She's run to her cousin, who is also impossibly pregnant, uh, but of course for her in her old age. Um, she can run to Elizabeth, uh, but eventually she's got to go home and, and something has to happen. And boy, all she's got is the mercy of God. And little does she know at this point, but that in God's mercy, he sends an angel also to Joseph to tell him that the child that Mary has is, is to be great and to be named Jesus. So all she has is his mercy and it turns out that's all she actually needs. You know, back, back to the, the business of mercy. <clears throat> it seems to me that what we forget is that God's mercy doesn't arrive until we have a crisis or sorrow or a tragedy. And we don't recognize, you know, we don't see God working in our regular lives until something really terrible happens. And then all of a sudden we realize that uh, his mercy is what gets us through that particular event in our lives. And, you know, that's the difference between joy and happiness that joy is when we see our lives through god's mercy yeah. and recognize the sorrow that brings that mercy mercy yeah amen thanks for listening to my sermon <laughs> yeah <laughs> i listened to all your sermons <laughs> i know i but my I, that i was um yeah i told that story at the beginning about somebody ended up Con confessing they didn't go to church because they didn't know we were pregnant because we only shared the news at church so uh, <laughs> wait what's that about a baby yeah okay everybody skips church once in a while it's okay we have god's mercy yeah okay so yeah the first the first work of god is god's mercy and god's glad to show his mercy and in fact mary says this mercy is for generation to generation which might remind us of uh, all the way back in the ten commandments in exodus when when there's a there's a threat and a promise. You know, the threat, of course, is God visiting the sins of the fathers upon the children, which I think we've all suffered from our parents' sins. I'm currently sinning against my children, and they'll suffer from it, and then they'll tell their therapist about it someday, and, and it'll be okay. But, uh, but when God threatens that breaking his commandments do actually does produce death in the family or in relationships, then the promise is, but God shows his steadfast love to the thousandth generation. To those who keep his commandments and here uh, mary picks up on that is um, god's heart is to show mercy generation after generation um, it is not god's deep desire to punish children for the sins of their fathers um, but uh, uh, but when that happens it is only for the sake that there might be a an open ear to hear his mercy and to produce uh to produce grace like Judy said, to, the, the sorrow then becomes the only occasion where God can get an ear from us to listen to his mercy. So, um, so Luther's going to identify these three groups of people that God 
shows his strength to or deals with, and the three groups of people that God is going to lift up. Of course, the three groups of, of people that um, God's going to come against are uh, the proud, the powerful, and the rich. The proud, the powerful, and the rich. And then the three groups he's going to lift up, of course, then the opposite there. Um, um, he's already, we've already mentioned the, those who fear him, which is the opposite of being proud in your heart. Uh, and then the lowly lifted up and the hungry filled with good things, which certainly sounds like a lot more than just food, although it would also be food filled with good things. So these are the six, six groups of people, two, you know, uh, you know, two kind of two different sets of the godly and the wicked. And um, one of the things Luther does is he talks about, well, how does God work on our lives? Because, you know, most of us uh, think we're in control of this thing. <laughs> uh, we, we make our choices. We, we make our bed and sleep in it. Uh, we, uh, we dig our hole and trip in it. Uh, how does God work? And, and Luther identifies kind of two ways God works is that um, when God works through us, through creatures, through instruments, um, then we see that his his will is mixed in with um, tools that are uh, broken and chipped and rusty and unreliable, so that uh, uh, you can you can you can see who the strong are and you can see who the weak are because uh, it just kind of looks like the rich get richer and the poor get children and um, and on we go, um, and and we find when we just look at the surface of things we find that God seems to work uh, at least in in, in part by um, you know, some people, uh, some people become mighty, and then God will um, use another people to cut them down to size. This happens throughout the Bible, where one nation rises up, and it becomes sort of God's rod of punishment for another, but then time goes on, and that nation then becomes the one that is, is, to, be, uh, is to be punished as well. Um, all of this is very hidden, and, and of course, now thousands of years later, none of us want to uh, call a news conference and say, well, it looks like God is using the rod of uh, China and this, maybe this virus that maybe came from there, maybe accidentally. He's using this rod to punish the United States for sorry, their... I couldn't hear what oh, you said. Oh, sorry. My watch is talking to me. Uh, to, then, to then say, well, now God is punishing the United States for all of its imperialism through the rod of China. I mean, who... I mean, nobody... I, not even... Uh, some people that I would think might say that are saying that, right? Um, and so we, we instead see that God is working hiddenly. Like, Lord, what are you doing here? It looks like things are getting uh, worse. But then there's another way that God works, um, which is apart from creatures, apart from our own uh, strength, our own gifts, and even our own desires and motivations and plans is that God is up to something else, which is also hidden, but that only, only people of faith know it or have it. So for example, um, uh, God will let the strong get stronger and, and puff themselves up in their own power until the point when, to su a surprise to them, God will pop the bubble and the powerful all of a sudden are brought low. And they say, oh, I should have seen this coming. I had no idea. Uh, or um, uh, God will uh, allow his people to bear the cross and to suffer for the sake of the world and suffer for the sake of the gospel, to, uh, to, 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 lose, uh, to lose things perhaps. Um, but faith knows that God has promised and, and, and God will, um, will break in to sorrowful places, will break into hopeless situations and show himself, show his mercy, show his power, show his strength. Uh, hidden in the weakness, like Paul told the Corinthians, uh, when I am weak, then I am strong. God's grace is sufficient for me. This is, this is the way of the cross. You know, this is Christ who God incarnate, God in the flesh, yet crucified, losing all his power or, or giving it up, uh, powerless on the cross. And there through his own death, uh, through everything inflicted to him, he actually... Um, he becomes the strength of anyone who is suffering or, or empty or hungers for righteousness. Um, and, and of course, in his resurrection, then 
who but God could have done this? Um, uh, God alone could then produce life from death. So it's no, uh, no surprise that in verse 51, when God shows his strength, uh, the proud are scattered in the thoughts of their hearts. Uh, uh, they don't see it coming. And insofar as you and I are proud, we don't see it coming. We are surprised when, hey, I thought I was God's, I thought I was God's child. Why is this suffering happening to me? Well, we're surprised. Uh, uh, When God is working with these groups of people, it's interesting that uh, at least Luther makes something of interest about the order that they come. So we have the proud, we have the powerful, and then we have the rich. And Luther talks about these as, um, in, one, in one way, enemies of God. And he says the rich are the least of his enemies. The mighty are much more hostile, but the learned ones, the proud, are the worst of all because of their influence on others. So here's what Luther says. He says, the rich destroy the truth among themselves. The mighty drive the truth away from others, but the wise ones, the proud ones, utterly extinguish the truth itself and replace it with other things, the imagination of their own hearts, so the truth cannot come into its own again. So I think this is kind of interesting um, that the rich, the rich, uh, um, you know, have have their own sort of self-inflicted wounds. Uh, the powerful certainly can uh, uh, drive truth away from others, but it's the it's the proud in the imagination of the heart, the thoughts of the heart, that becomes the worst enemy of all because it begins to say, "What is truth? There's no." overarching truth to this whole thing. Uh, there's nothing that stands behind human history or stands over uh, uh, this world or the universe. Uh, and so then in destroying truth um, has, has, um, ha has um, uh, left us with absolutely nothing. You know what, I see this is happening right now. Yeah, how do you see this happening right now, Carol? Because what has been going on with the political part of the, of the world right now. Yeah. In our own United States. Yeah. Everything here is true. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. You can think what you want, but. Right. That's it. Yeah. Tom, you know, it, the difficult part is when you think you know everything and you think you're right, who is it? that's going to discern the truth of your belief. And when we don't communicate together, and especially in the church, I mean, this is why it's such a hard time right now, is that we aren't sitting and discussing things and saying, okay, what is God saying in this passage? What are we doing here? And it's hard to discern when you're the one doing the talking. Yeah. Yeah or, when be... yeah, or when there's absolutely no discussion, public discussion allowed across political divisions. Yeah. yeah. So you can't, if you even have a conversation with somebody from the right or the left, you are giving them a microphone to spread hate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then you would just assume the worst that each side is trying to destroy either a country or, uh, or non-white uh, races, or you just, you name the, you name the big, the big specter. But we also have to remember that that's been happening in the church for centuries too. When we that's get to the point where we disagree on something, then we split. We don't get together and figure out how to solve the problem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's the Reformation's dangerous idea is, the, <laughs> is that uh, once you don't have a pope, everybody's the pope. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Luther himself said, uh, uh, "For I have that great, uh, I have that great pope uh, inside my own heart. Um, you know, the the me, myself, and I. That's the unholy trinity, um, the great pope that sits on my own heart and 
tells me I'm right about everything. We got to we got to keep pressing because I got some stuff I don't want to miss. Um, you know, Luther is always very vivid, so he talks about uh, the learned and proud hypocrites uh, are the devil's own tidbits. He loves to, uh, to to feast on the daintiest and choicest morsels like a bear on honey. Uh, so that's that's colorful. Um, you know, God's always showing that his salvation comes um, not from human power, but from God's power alone. As Paul told the Corinthians, you know, we, uh, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, that Paul uh, preaches Christ crucified alone. And this is, this is either a, a scandal uh, to the Jews or a stumbling block uh, to the Jews or, or scandalous to the Greeks. Um, it has no, it has no uh, handles to hold in this old world. Uh, there's nothing about a crucified God that actually uh, sells on the market, you know, especially not if that crucified God calls us to follow him. Uh, so again, um, it looks like there's nothing but rich and poor, but to faith, Mary sings, and we can see that if God has given us his mercy in Christ, um, then Take, take it or leave it with riches, take it or leave it with power, take it or leave it with um, pride and knowledge, uh, human knowledge, um, that if you have God's mercy, you have, um, you have everything, and he will fulfill his promise um, and lift you up. Luther says some things which are pretty uh, uh, hard to hear for those of us who have retirement funds. <laughs> Uh, which is all of us, uh, except Gramer, maybe. Are you saving for retirement, Gramer? Not yet. Okay. All right. Um, you know, he lives, this is 500 years ago, so what applies now? But um, if you imagine, you know, up until not too long ago, I mean, 100 years plus, um, you raise your children, and then when you get old, your children take you in, <laughs> or you just continue as part of the family homestead or, or whatnot. Um, you don't need retirement accounts because there's always going to be somebody younger in your family who can work and support the family. And this just goes on and on through the generations. Um, and so Luther speaks really strongly about, you know, when God is promising to fill the hungry with good things, he's going to say that it's faithless for us to store up riches for tomorrow. That it's faithless to have good laid, goods laid up to help yourself, especially when there are hungry people today. And that is something that is just so countercultural to us. Um, we don't have to agree with him, but I do. It does give me pause to say, I have just. I live in a world where I don't even consider that one day my retirement will mean we figure out which son wants to bring us into their home and have us live there. Uh, and so, therefore, then my entire retirement account can go straight to the food pantries and the clothes boutiques and the ministries of the, the, the of need. We just don't think this way. Um, and, and so then we perhaps have placed our, uh, placed our hope not only in God and his mercy, but we've also placed our hope in our own riches and in our own pride and the imaginations of our, of our heart and of our financial advisor. <laughs> One thing people get a lot older now. So yeah. my mom, for example, is 85, and even if she had to live with us, she couldn't afford it because she's in the position all the time. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gramer was pointing out that people live a lot longer now, mm -hmm. and the medical care is so extensive and expensive that you that they you couldn't have her, you know, her 85-year-old grandmother in their home because of what she needs. Yeah. Yep. So you can, you know, there's, there's many, many gifts we enjoy in our day and time and place, but it also kind of pulls us apart, Gener generations pulled apart, mm -hmm. and perhaps other ways, even among our peers, pulled apart. You know, and of course, the more that we, the more that, uh, the more that material support comes through institutions and through government funding, um, the more we just rely on those institutions to care for people and we don't ever have to care. Um, so uh, we're forced to care by paying taxes. But other than that, then we say, well, the government will take care of, of everybody or of us when we're in need. 
Um, and this becomes a little more depersonalized than, uh, than what the Christian community uh, had always been. So you're saying that we shouldn't prepare for... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying that's what Luther said, so... Uh, but you're Lutheran. That's right. Well, Lutheran just means uh, you read the scriptures. Uh, it doesn't mean we, we read everything or agree with everything Luther says. Okay. Yeah. Luther, Lutheran was a put down from the Catholics and it just became our name. Yep. No, but I, what, I, what I would at least say is that in Mary's song, she is, she is uh, poor and yet trusting that God will fill her with good things and raise her and, and pour Israel up. And that because I have a retirement account that is on track, right? Someday I'm uh, God willing could retire and, you know, I don't know, do something, <laughs> do something else. Uh, and that that, uh, Robert, would, that, that reality will play a role in my trust in God because I know I have God. I guess I could trust God that the stock market will stick around, but, but there's already this reality where I'm, I don't have to depend on other people that God provides to care for me, but I have to instead depend on my own storing up of riches. But just remember, this is, uh, we live in God's mercy, so there's no law uh, against these things. Um, but we should be, as Luther says, willing, willing to lose things and willing also to lend a hand to those in need, even if our financial advisor says it's going to cost us a, a, a vacation. And Tom, isn't the truth of it truly though? We can make our own plans to save for retirement. Yes. But God's yeah. still in control. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you know, like we've seen, like uh, the mighty, the mighty, the proud, and the rich don't uh, don't see it coming. Uh, um, and uh, you know, there are people who retire multimillionaires and they're dead in a year. Mm -hmm. We just we just know this is how it is and. Um, and so we are, we ought to encourage each other as people of faith to whatever you think retirement is going to be. And you have, you can teach me, uh, whatever you think retirement is going to be. Um, I know it's not sitting around doing nothing or just pleasing yourself because that, that can only go so far. Um, uh, and so then what about retirement can be put into our lives when we're in high school or when we're raising children? You know, there's ways that we can retire every Sabbath. <laughs> uh, you know, there's ways that we can live now and we don't have to have some dream of saving up all this money so that nobody has to help us for 30 years and we die at 90 or something. Yeah. Two more years. Two more years. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, the end you know, of the song. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say. All retirees ought to read a little bit of Wendell Berry because he's yeah. got it all put together. You have a community that loves each other and takes care of each other. And some of us are richer than others. And some of us are never going to be anything but poor and irresponsible. But it doesn't matter because we're all in the same community and we have to love each other. That's and, great. Uh, you know, I mean, every like I say, all those books are in the library. Read those books if you're in retirement age. Yeah, especially, the, especially, there's a book uh, named after, not named, it's not named after you, Jack, but Wendell Berry, The, the Memory of Old Jack. Yeah, the Memory of Old Jack. Yep. It's about an old cantankerous man who lives in a hotel with a couple of other retired ladies and the town just kind of takes care of old Jack. But, uh, but in this book, Jack also uh, takes, he takes care of, um, of, a, of a mother who lost her husband in the war and had a child that he never really knew. And, uh, and so there's a lot of crossover of generations. It can only happen in a small town. It can only happen in a small town or a congregation. That's right. Yeah. So, so the, uh, the song ends by now going... Um, Again, to the mercy of God, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, according to the promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Um, uh, another translation for descendants is, and to his seed forever. And 
there's a couple of places in the New Testament where either Paul or here um, Mary through Luke um, take the word seed and say um, it's singular meaning Jesus, not just plural meaning all of Abraham's grandchildren. Um, Paul does this in talking about Abraham's seed and, and that was promised. Um, and so people can translate this different ways to kind of lean towards a, a, a different interpretation. But uh, overall, what Mary is doing is she's returning to her own story. She's taken us through the six works of God to, uh, to scatter and lift up, to bring down and to lift up, to fill and to send away empty, those six works of God. And then returns to this promise made to Abraham and to his seed, which now grows in her and in her uh, womb and, and, and her child, uh, Christ, or would be Christ, would be Messiah. And this would be the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel, to Abraham and, and forever. So she returns to this in, the incarnation, returns to the uh, primary gift of God's grace, uh, which is Jesus. And, um, and of course, Luther talks about this being, um, this is the bosom of Abraham, so that all who came before Jesus trusted in the promise made to Abraham, and all who came after Jesus trust in the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. So you don't have to worry about, you know, what about all those people of God that lived and died before Jesus came around? What happened to them? Well, they believed in Jesus because they were the people of the promise made to Abraham and to his seed. Okay. Um, and then uh, two, two quick things from Luther uh, that I think are interesting. This is 1521. So he's already written a lot of his significant um, works. He's about four years into the Reformation. Uh, he's one year into, he's in the first year of being an outlaw <laughs> uh, uh, whose life is, um, is forfeit if uh, the emperor's people uh, uh, would get him. So he's living under the protection of his prince. So think about him writing and thinking about the Magnificat as he himself is surviving because of the protection of the mighty and he's writing and preaching and teaching against the imaginations of the heart of the proud. Um, and uh, although the Reformation is well underway, by the end of this reflection, he says this, may Christ grant us this right understanding of the Magnificat through the intercession and for the sake of his dear mother, Mary. So in 1521, he's still, uh, he's still suggesting at least that um, Mary intercedes for us through her own prayers and intercessions. Um, this will become a clearer break, um, especially by 1530 at the Augsburg Confession, that the intercession of saints, the call for us to call upon saints to sort of put in a good word for us in heaven, um, that that is not something that scripture gives. But it also doesn't seem to be that scripture forbids it either, but we simply do not know. And so um, it's just a little hint here that Luther is still, um, uh, it finds in Mary an example for us, uh, and not just an example, but that um, for Mary's sake, uh, um, and perhaps for her ongoing, uh, her ongoing prayers for us, um, that Christ may grant us um, this grace through, uh, through the Magnificat. Then the last thing he says, of course, Luther wrote this uh, reflection on the Magnificat. He wrote it for the 17-year-old Prince John Frederick, who was not yet in power, but he was 17 years old and would come into power. So uh, he, he finally, uh, he finally uh, gives him a word about loving his subjects and uplifting and improving his people. Um, and then the last thing he says is, your grace should pluck up courage and be of good cheer. Put away your timidity and can you yourself converse with God in your heart or in a secret place? Um, basically, he says, uh, don't trust in other people's prayers without praying yourself. Uh, you go ahead and, uh, and go straight to God yourself. And so he, uh, he's bold to say that to his future prince. But, you know, I've always felt about this whole business about saints saints were just like us they were just folks they were sinners yeah some people thought they did some miraculous things lots of people do miraculous things and so it's not so much 
whether we pray to them, it's that, you know, if I have a, a dear saint in my life, uh, you know, a, you know, it, who knows at what point I'm going to say, gosh, I wonder what she would have done or would have said to me as a mentor in this situation in my life. And to me, that's, those people are just as much alive as those of us sitting here. And why shouldn't I talk to them in that sense? So, you know, I think we just get it all confused because we forget that we are all in the same boat. We are all saints and we are all sinners. Yeah, well, the difference between the saints, which the ones they call the saints, and the ordinary saints is because the other ones are vocal about it. Hmm. Now my grandmother, I consider I would consider her a saint, and she hardly said didn't say much, but she lived a wonderful life and was a loving person. I consider her a saint, and she wasn't vocal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, yeah. Uh, There's a lot of hidden saints out there. Well, today, if you want to, somebody hear you, you got to be vocal about it. If you want to believe in something, if you want to push something, you have to be very vocal about it. You're always going to have enemies because there's always somebody that disagrees with you. Yeah. And then you have to believe in what you say. Yeah. So it comes and goes. Well, Luther had to fight politics there too. Yeah. He had to cater to somebody to get to say what he wanted to say. Sure. Yep. Okay, this is Mary's song. We've done it. No, I was just thinking. Yes, Carol. What Joseph was doing all these three months. I bet you're yeah. kind of anxious to see Mary, and you know. He was pondering too, probably. Yeah. I mean, but he had a job. Yeah, I know, but it's. it's <laughs> he had to go to work. Think yeah. of yourself, Tom. If you were yeah. away from Andrea for three months, you know, yeah. It, it, I don't know. Yeah. Some people go to work and they're gone for a month. Same yeah. time. Same thing. Anyway. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot going on. Yeah. And Patty was looking through the uh, Facebook and was. Uh, we saw some of the gifts of the pandemic. Uh, Catalina Island had no idea they had buffalo, and they were down roaming the beach huh. because no vi uh, no visitors to the island. Huh. They weren't pushed up. Yeah. Wow. And I'm sure other things like that are happening all over the world. That uh, you know, nature's coming back to its. Yeah, the, own. the, the ozone's taking a breath. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, thank you for coming upstairs for a few weeks and we'll, of course, uh, well, yeah, you're welcome. We'll, of course, break for a few weeks. Um, the first Sunday in January, we'll have something, uh, but I don't, I don't have it for you today, but we'll be back. We'll do some, <laughs> we'll carry on. So yeah, God bless and keep you this week and, and uh, keep re receiving, responding and rejoicing. Yep. So, thank you, Tom. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Robert and Judy. Thank you. Yeah.